So thanks so much for the lovely introduction. Um, thank you to Shannon, if you're still out there, Shannon, for all of her work organizing and facilitating my event. Thanks to each of you for sharing your time with me today. And of course, Todd Hamilton for the invitation and for hosting me. Um, so today I am going to share what is a really small piece of this much larger uh, research agenda that I've been developing over the last few years with a number of wonderful collaborators. Um, that's all really trying to kind of center around this central goal of expanding how demographers think about and conceptualize and measure mortality. So we kind of reflexively think about mortality as this really, you know, clean individual outcome to study, this, this single marker of a single life cut short. But in all of the work that I'm doing in recent years is really trying to study mortality from the vantage point of survivors. And some of this work is oriented towards the macro to think about how we can actually, you know, take our tools and our techniques and the same data that we've always used to kind of reorient um, our understanding of slowly evolving mortality regimes and mortality shocks by kind of studying the height, the reach, and the scale of mortality, not in terms of our, you know, standard rates, but instead from the vantage point of how many people are intimately affected by specific deaths and, and death events in their social and familial network. And then some of this agenda is really focused on the micro level, just trying to work to understand you know, what are the life course implications of experiencing death in one's family and social network? And this work is focused both in the U.S. and internationally, um, where, of course, uh, we know mortality is, you know, much higher. And so individuals risk of being exposed to deaths in their family and social network is, is much greater. Um, so all of this work is really just trying to kind of demonstrate all we can gain from baking into our theories, our measures, and our models, I guess this morbid recognition that our deaths are principally experienced by others. So the paper that I'll tell you about today tries to harness this recognition um, to push on this kind of age-old theoretical puzzle in demography of uh, mortality change and learning lags. This question of, you know, in transitioning populations, experiencing the mortality change that we think is really consequential to their subsequent behaviors, whether they actually experience that aggregate mortality change unfolding around them, and if not, how their individual life course experiences may help us to understand why um, their perceptions are clouded. All right, so as you can see, this is in progress work because even the title changed um, from what I submitted. So trust that I very much welcome your comments and questions um, as we continue to develop this work. All right, so here you're looking at what have been these remarkable declines in under five mortality rates across the globe for the last 70 years. This has arguably been one of the defining features of population change on the global stage. We see this precipitous year-over-year -year decline in child mortality rates in all world regions, declines that are projected to continue in the ensuing decades. Of course, some of your eyes may be drawn to the you know, persistent inequalities between world regions, which are projected to shrink as we increasingly have this very clear demographic story of a world wherein more and more children are surviving to their fifth birthday. And as demographers, we appreciate um, that these dramatic improvements not only signify advancements in child health and population health more broadly, but also because mortality decline is a primary and universally established feature of demographic transition, as you see depicted in this stylized model. And it's one that we demographers and transition theory has argued has a number of implications for subsequent population change, namely fertility decline. So even though the relationship between um, populations, mortality levels and fertility levels have argue, arguably kind of eluded us empirically, um, we've spent the better part of multiple decades researching the micro level processes by which we think this for mortality fertility literature, um, or I'm sorry, this mortality fertility literature stems from. So there's, you know, vast demographic literature emphasizing how in transitioning societies, aggregate mortality decline, principally child mortality decline, because that's the mortality decline that we see happen first, has a number of implications for adult subsequent behavior. 
it um uh, new low mortality affects, you know, how people think about family building, their desire in terms of their the number of children that they intend to have. Um, there's been work written about how uh, child mortality levels affect actual fertility behavior at the micro level through uh, most notably insurance and replacement effects. So we have this clear, you know, tradition in our field of um, working to understand how these aggregate mortality shifts really intimately affect people's behaviors through predominantly a series of volitional mechanisms. Other work has written a little broad, more broadly about how mortality decline affects how parents think about investing in their kids, right? Under high mortality conditions, if you're not so sure your child will survive to reap any of the delayed benefits of your investments, you may not invest in that, in that child as much. But of course, under new low mortality conditions, parents are thought to invest um, much more in their children, given their increasing confidence that that child will survive. Um, but what this project interrogates is this kind of overlooked assumption built into these theoretical models, which is that people perceive these reductions that we analysts can so clearly see in our data, right? This very idea that mortality decline can and will act as a catalyst of subsequent demographic behaviors is predicated on this assumption that people perceive the mortality conditions unfolding around them. Um, and in this project, we really are questioning whether or not this is the case, right? In a transitioning society where there's so much demographic change unfolding at the same time, we can imagine that it may be quite difficult for ordinary people actually to perceive their mortality declines that are defining their context and that we have theorized um, acts as a guidepost to their subsequent behaviors. And subsequently, we also want to understand, you know, if there's a large share of individuals that aren't perceiving mortality change, why is this the case? You know, can we kind of make sense of this? Is it patterned systematically? And I'll say that we're not the first to think of this topic or to write about this. Um, I would argue it's kind of been left to the margins of our field. But, you know, a number of demographers, Alaka Basu, Mark Montgomery, John Cleland, John Sandberg, come to my mind immediately, have raised this question that, you know, in transitioning contexts, many people may not perceive mortality decline. And I would say that a lot of the demographic scholarship that's been written about this has been kind of quick to adopt more of a, a psychological perspective of why this is the, is the case and has really emphasized the cognitive biases that all affect us as humans, right? So, uh, Mark Montgomery in particular has written a lot about how, you know, humans are just inherently bad at calculating probabilities. We have this tendency to ignore denominators, to focus on the number of events versus event probability or probability risk. And so demographers, I think, have kind of adopted this narrative that cognitive biases are what, you know, would lead to misperceptions. But in this paper, we're really trying to take a more sociological lens to say, well, like, can we actually unpack it a little bit more and see if, you know, misperceptions are clearly anchored in individuals' life course experiences? Okay, so we um, pursue these questions in the context of Malawi um, by studying a, 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 a cohort of young women in Balaka, Malawi, which is a community in the southern region of the country. So you can see the gray shaded area is the time in which our sample was born. And then the data that I'll focus on today were collected in 2019 and in 2009 and a few years following. And so as you can see depicted here, there's been um, dramatic declines in infant mortality in Malawi and in Balaka and Southern Malawi in particular, over the life course that these young women, as these young women have come to age. And so we wanna understand when we talk to these young women in their 20s and 30s, we wanna understand, you know, do they perceive this downward trend line that we can very clearly see here? And then we also wanna understand their understanding of current mortality levels and current mortality risk. Are they aware that somewhere between four to 6% of infants are 
um, expected to die prior to their fifth birthday, or do they have kind of an inflated perception of infant mortality due to the conditions of yesteryear? Um, I'll say that the context that we're talking about today is is not as like any society is is much more complex than this you know beautiful linear figure that you see here. Um, during these young women's life, there was kind of a lot of demographic storms, if you will, happening in the background. These young women experienced a very severe HIV AIDS epidemic that, as I will show you, hollowed their kinship structures in really profound ways. Um, young women living in Malawi also deal with, and, and young families more generally, deal with kind of layered, clustered vulnerabilities of living in a persistently resource poor context that has, you know, minimal institutional frameworks in place and lacks um, infrastructural provisions. And so there's been an acceleration of climate shocks and their um, uh, real population consequences in this context, as well as kind of run of the mill issues that, you know, families have been facing in, in this kind of unsettled, precarious environment including things like food security. So you can imagine that, you know, the, the world is much more complex, just like the society that we all came of age in is not, you know, one single figure, figure. So we can imagine that, you know, other demographic processes could certainly be clouding uh, women's perception of this trend line. But of course, we also want to understand, you know, this group of women who are living in a relatively homogenous social and demographic context, you know, what just... What patterns, kind of any variability in their perceptions, what social factors may actually contribute to variation in how they see the world? Okay, so in this project, we're really trying to push on, I guess, three theoretical fronts. Um, so the first is this question of whether mortality perceptions are quote unquote settled disposition, so barring from the language of Kylie and Vasey. So some work has argued that, you know, people's ideas about the world, their frameworks um, of, of uh, you know, various beliefs and ideas and conditions are settled quite early in the life course, right? That very early life course experiences has this really powerful anchoring effect. And then individuals have a hard time kind of updating their ideas, um, even when new information presents itself and challenges those ideas, right? So from this person, so it's the idea, right, that perceptual frames are very sticky. They, you know, we're not good at kind of re revising our um, beliefs or ideas. And so using this kind of framework, this would lead us to hypothesize that, you know, if we think kind of individuals' very intimate experiences of family and social network mortality matters, this would suggest that, you know, mortality events that women endured very early in their life would be what kind of anchor their perceptions of aggregate conditions in adulthood, right? So from this framework, we would think, you know, experiencing an infant sibling die or experiencing uh, an older sibling's infant die would be the, you know, kinds of life course events that would kind of anchor women's uh, propensity to maintain very elevated mortality perceptions years later. I will say, if you do have clarifying questions, feel free to interject. Um, okay. Another perspective, though, really challenges this idea and instead contends that perceptual frames aren't, you know, permanently set in um, in early life, but instead are flexible, are even capricious. Um, they're ready to be kind of actively updated based on new information. Um, and so from this perspective, right, we would expect that, you know, maybe women's kind of understanding of aggregate mortality trends shifts over time and shifts in ways as new experiences are accrued. And so again, kind of thinking about, well, how could intimate exposures of death kind of color women's perceptions? This would imply that, you know, if you were to ask women, like, what's your idea about mortality today, that mo very recent exposures to death in their family and social network would be what it kind of correlates with their tendency to maybe overestimate mortality risk. 
right? So this would give us a very different kind of perspective of, um, you know, what we would anticipate to see in terms of linkages between life course experiences and perceptions. Um, of course, if we do see kind of this evidence of this subtle disposition, this would be the foundation for um, very long learning lags between mortality change and people's tendency to revise their behaviors in result of it, right? So, but if we see an actively updating framework, this would give us an idea that actually, you know, perceptions may be this really pliable thing that you could actually intervene on to shift behavior. And there's some work that's being done on this in the context of HAB. All right, so these are kind of these competing theoretical frameworks that we wanna test. And then a third front that we're trying to push on in this paper is not as clearly grounded in the existing literature, but one that I'm really interested in, um, which is this question of the specificity by which people um, think about death experiences in their lives, right? So as demographers, we very we care deeply about our denominators, and we care very specific, you know about our kind of subpopulation bins, if you will. So we think carefully about infant mortality, adolescent mortality, adult mortality. But I question whether ordinary people actually think about mortality in this way, um, especially in a context like Malawi, where diagnostic capabilities in, in health institutions aren't as advanced as we experience here in the U.S. So a lot of causes of death are kind of contested in this environment. But in a place where, you know, death comes quickly and often, I do wonder if people kind of you know, think about death in a much more unifying way than we demographers have. They may not carefully, you know, think about risk as it pertains to infants specifically or adults specifically. And so this is something else that we're testing in this paper is to see, well, you know, is it exposure to infant mortality that affects women's perceptions of infant mortality, or is it just any death exposures that may lead to um, different perceptual frames? Okay, so the data that um, we're using in this project were collected largely for the, this purpose. Um, we are making use of Sigola Latanzi data from the third wave of data collection. So many of you may know about these data. They've been published on widely. The project was started by Jenny Trinitopoli and Sarah Yateman with NICHD funding between 2009 and 2015. And then thanks to um, a career award from the Max Planck Society that I received, we were able to field another round of data collection in 2019. So now we have this 10 year panel um, data on this cohort of women. And in 2019, we collected um, a new cross section. So we fully refreshed the sample so that we have a, a new representative cross section of women living in Balaka. Um, TLT features a centralized research center, which is unusual in this context. Women come complete their interviews with the privacy of a closed door in a quiet place. All interviews are conducted by the wonderful team of local interviewers that are um, on the project. Today, I will focus mostly on results from the 2019 data, but then I'll kind of show how those data are informing how we're thinking about the historic data and, and are going back to use those data to um, get some further empirical insights into what we're finding. Okay. Um, so measuring mortality perceptions is a, a tricky feat and, and one uh, that I think has kind of left demographers or encouraged demographers to kind of leave this area untouched in some way. Um, but we are employing kind of two ways of measuring mortality perceptions to really push on these ideas. So the first is this very simple question that we asked women. We designed this survey module where we just ask women to tell us like how they feel about various things going on in Balaka. How do they feel, you know, school, school quality is? How do they feel about the HIV AIDS epidemic and the severity of it? How do they feel about food security? And one of the questions that we asked them is, you know, what do you think about child mortality in the past relative today? So just a very general open-ended question. Um, and then respond, I'm sorry, interviewers recorded respondents answers depending on what they voiced in the interview setting, but they weren't prompted by these responses. But if women said, you know, oh, I think child mortality was worse 
Um, in the past, they would report it accordingly as, you know, either better today, worse today, about the same. And then we did have a few women who responded that, you know, it's erratic, it changes every year. Or some women said it's too hard to say, right? They're too uncertain about mortality conditions and they didn't feel comfortable responding. And we're asking women to think about, and we kind of anchored their responses in 1990, which was when they were very young or even before um, some of them were born um, and, and how basically mortality has changed over this 30 year horizon. All right, and then we also used this really cool um, interactive elicitation method for trying to get at actually how women think about mortality risk today. So Delavon and Colaire developed this um, really neat module and it's been widely tested and, and, and used in survey research in Malawi, where basically this module involves giving women 10 dried beans. And the start of this module, you know, prompts women to say, I'm giving, you know, the interviewer explains, I'm giving you these 10 beans. We're going to talk about how likely you think um, an event is to occur using these beans, right? And they kind of walk them through this exercise. There's a ton written about this. So if you're interested in this methodology, I encourage you to go read more about it. But it's been demonstrated to be a really effective way to get a sense of, of um, individuals' ideas about the probability of certain events in their own life and in other people's lives. It's been shown to be, in the case of HIV research, individuals' um, kind of subjective risk perceptions are, are really um, uh, predictive of their actual HIV risk status, right? So this is kind of an interesting way to think about, you know, can we actually attach a, a more specific probability to women's ideas about child mortality um, risk in particular? And so women were specifically in this, the data that I'll use today, were asked how likely they think a baby born in Balaka will die within one year. And then they, you know, slide across the table how many beans they would um, think correspond with that risk. So zero beans would be a 0% probability, seven, a 70%, 10, 100%. Any questions? Arun, following me? Okay, great. Um, okay, and so then in 2019, we also wanted to collect these really rich family histories to try to understand, you know, well, what is kind of, kind of the, the cumulative life course exposure to familial death in this context? And so all the thanks here goes to Eric Lungu, who is a collaborator and co-author on this project that survived, um, that uh, uh, generated this module, helped design it and implement it in the most efficient way to reduce respondent fatigue, because of course families are large in Malawi. And so we wanted to be really careful to not kind of make people, incentivize them to not tell us about family members. Um, but we asked people these detailed family histories and asked them to tell us about their grandparents, parents, siblings, siblings, children, spouses, and children. And so with these data, we collected information on rough birth dates and death dates for those no longer alive. So to the extent that we can use these retrospective data, we can kind of reconstruct at least family exposure to mortality in one's family across time. Um, with some general understanding of the timing of those events. And so with these data, well, so here actually you're looking at um, the percent of women's kin networks that they reported on that were already this deceased by the time they were interviewed. So if you recall, this is a sample of women in their 20s and 30s. And as you can see, um, the uh, the modal distribution is right that about 20 percent of women's kin networks 20 percent of the kin ties that women reported were already deceased by the time of the interview so this is an enormous amount of exposure to familial loss um in this context um but what's also really interesting here and i think that's uh, that's um we're trying to kind of leverage in this paper is that there's actually, you know, among women living in this very small seven kilometer radius, there's a lot of heterogeneity in how much familial death that they've experienced. So despite the fact that they're living in the same socio-demographic context, we see, you know, a, quite a bit of variation in the amount of mortality they've been exposed to, at least in their family network. 
So with these data, we generate a few variables to, again, kind of link back to these theoretical models that we want to test to study this idea that, you know, mortality perceptions are settled in early life, most likely to be informed by early life mortality exposures. We generate variables focusing on the intensity of early life exposure to infant death in particular. So if they experience in the first five years of life, another infant dying. And we also look at later childhood and adolescence as well. To get at this kind of active updating, we look at very proximally experienced deaths. You know, did they experience a family member die within the calendar year um, just before 2019, the time at which we asked their perceptions? We also supplement these familial data um, with data on women's recent funeral attendance. So women are asked in 2009, how many funerals have you attended recently? 67% of women had attended a funeral in the past month. 9% report having attended a funeral in the past month for month for a baby in particular. Um, funerals have been studied pretty widely in this context and have been shown to um, kind of prime people to think about mortality. And so we consider the intensity of funeral uh, attendance also as this other marker of women's very proximally experienced death because we're talking about the one month prior to the time of the survey. And then, of course, we want to get at this, you know, question of is it only infant deaths that matter or is it just any deaths that matter? So we calculate, we generate infant specific indicators as well as more generic, just any loss measures. All right. So to some results. And um, this is what we analysts see, right? We see this very clear downward trajectory in infant mortality in this context over a 30 year period. When we ask women, only 31% agree with this. Only 31%, a third of women say that mortality was higher in the past than it is today, which is quite striking in and of itself, right? A lot of women in this context aren't perceiving of this like simple downward trend. 53% report that child or infant mortality was lower in the past than it is today, directly defying what we demographers have theorized is acting as kind of a guidepost for individuals' behaviors. About 15% of women say that, you know, it's about the same. And then a very small fraction said it's erratic or it's too hard to say, which is interesting in and of itself too, that women, you know, aren't confused. They feel confident that they can tell you what's happening demographically. They're not saying I'm too uncertain to tell you. It's just that they have a, a very different ideas about what um, aggregate mortality uh, change has looked like. So here you're looking not at just kind of their understanding of trajectory, but their actual understanding of risk in 2019 at the time of the survey. So this is the distribution of women's responses to the beans question. How likely do you think it is that an infant will die within one year? Um, we're approaching this in a few different ways. And the results that I'll show you today, we're taking kind of a just a, a binary approach, right? We know that true in the true infant mortality risk based on the infant mortality rates in this calendar year was between you know four to six percent. So we're grouping the women who responded zero beans ten percent because we didn't allow them to break beans in half, which interestingly Hans Peter Kohler and his data collection is starting to use peanuts so that you can break the peanut in half and, you know, get at smaller increments than just 10% increments. Um, but, you know, so women who respond zero to 10% are pretty close to like the empirical reality that we see in our data. So we're combining them here in the models I'll show you. And then about 60% of women have, you know, pretty inflated mortality perceptions. They say, you know, 20% or higher. Interestingly, we do see this kind of clumping at five beans. This has been demonstrated in other contexts and maybe does allude to like uncertainty. You know, women are saying a oh, 50-50, that could be interpreted as just, you know, I don't know, um, not specifically a 50% probability. But again, a lot of variation here to kind of be unpacked and to try to try to understand. Okay, so here I'm showing you some logistic regression models that are predicting this binary outcome. Do women have, you know, pretty accurate mortality perceptions of aggregate 
chain um, aggregate levels of infant mortality or do they have these inflated perceptions? And so I'm showing you very few coefficients here, but tests that we have run so many models <laughs> and, have, and, and have reconstructed these variables looking at not just infants, but under five-year-olds. We've kind of played with how we're thinking about early life, later life, but I'll, I'll show you results that kind of give you a gist of all of the many models that we've um, ran. Okay, so this first question of, you know, are these misperceptions kind of anchored in very early life course experiences of infant death in particular? We're finding no evidence that that's the case. We're really finding no signal there. So being exposed to, you know, more infant death early in life, insofar as your family is concerned, we're not finding that that's kind of predictive of women's uh, perceptions in adulthood. Interestingly, when we look and expand beyond just infants and think about the number of deaths generally, like did your parents die when you were very young, we're actually finding some indication of, you know, the opposite of what we would anticipate that greater exposure to adult mortality and, and mortality generally in early life decreases women's likelihood of having inflated perceptions in adulthood. So actually it has some kind of like anchoring effect where if you were, you know, intimately exposed to a lot of death early in life, you have a lower odds of um, having inflated perceptions in adulthood. Are you following me? So it's kind of this idea that like, yeah, if you were exposed to things being really bad in the past, that kind of helps you have more positive perceptions of what's happening today. So, you know, defies this idea that misperceptions are anchored early. If anything, it tells a, a very different story. All right, but then we shift to think about very proximally experienced deaths, you know, deaths that just happened. And what we find is that when we look at infant deaths in particular, again, we're not finding much signal. Recently, you know, going to a baby's funeral in particular does not seem to be very predictive of thinking infant mortality risks are very high in your community. But interestingly, the number of funerals women have very recently experienced in the past month has this strong, and I'll show you, very consistent association with women's elevated mortality perceptions. So this suggests, you know, support for this kind of active updating framework where being exposed to more death, attending more funerals very recently predicts women's likelihood of expressing elevated infant mortality perceptions. And so this, of course, um, is really interesting in a cross-sectional framework, but we can go back and use the longitudinal data to see the stability of this finding, because this is suggesting that, you know, perception should be bouncing and they should be consistently bouncing in accordance with women's exposure to mortality measured here as funeral attendance. So I just told you about results with the 2019 data. We can go back and some of these women in our 2019 data were also interviewed 10 years earlier in 2009 when they were much younger. And we can first just see, you know, in a simple cross tab, well, how much consistency is in their um, perceptions of aggregate mortality change. And what we see is when you talk to the same women in 2009 and 2019, there's a lot of movement in between um, whether or not they had accurate perceptions at one interview and inaccurate ones at a subsequent interview. So it does, it's not this case that, you know, these are the same women kind of selecting into these respondents. Instead, there's movement across this 10 year period in particular. And if we just use the 2009 data and say, OK, you know, let's see, let's try to predict using the same measure, measure of funeral attendance that was pertaining to one month prior to their 2009 interview, we can see, you know, does this funeral effect hold in the 2009 data? And we find that it does. Just like in 2019, having attended, you know, more funerals very recently corresponds with this elevated likelihood of reporting inflated mortality perceptions. And then TLT is even uh, a, a greater source of data for this because for two years of the longitudinal data, um, women were interviewed at four-month intervals over a two-year period. So we have this kind of rapid data collection design 
And at each of these interviews, women were asked about their recent funeral attendance and were asked about their infant mortality perceptions. And so with these data, we can really see, you know, does this kind of funeral inflated mortality perception link hold? And what we find is that it absolutely does. Um, but first, descriptively, what's also really interesting is that over this two year period, you know, asking women the same question repeatedly, there's a lot of noise and kind of how women respond to the question of, you know, how likely do you think an infant is to die in one year? So about 50% of women change their responses wave to wave um, at least once, and about 20% do three or more times. So again, this uh, kind of aligns with this active updating framework that, you know, perceptions are, are bouncy. People are willing to kind of revise them as new experiences happen. And we find this higher funeral attendance, kind of mortality priming event, and elevated mortality perceptions replicates in six of the eight waves of data. So we continuously are finding this link, suggesting it's quite a strong finding. Um, and interestingly, this effect holds when you, you know, account for a kind of baseline pre-death exposure perceptions and see if you know, a change in funeral attendance patterns corresponds with a shift in perceptions. Um, interestingly, you know, I've been toying around with like, well, how proximal is this effect? If you go back, you know, a wave, do you see that the number of funerals you attended four to five months ago matter? And it doesn't seem like it does. It's really the number of funerals you had in the prior month. So it suggests, you know, that these things are very kind of, you know, flexibly oriented um, in relation to your very recent experiences. Of course, I also tested, well, you know, does next wave funeral attendance predict perceptions? Because that would lead us to think that there's some kind of bias in our data and just selection, and it doesn't. So, you know, how many future funerals you're attending does not predict previous perceptions. So all of this is to say is this is a, a pretty strong finding. All right, so what do we make of this? Um, at first, you know, just descriptively, this demonstrates that we, you know, cannot and should not um, pursue theoretical models that assume, you know, that people are actively perceiving of the mortality um, decline that we have spent a lot of time theorizing is instructive for their, um, instructive to their um, behaviors and ideas. Um, this work also demonstrates that, you know, there's a really high burden of death exposures in this population that demographers haven't really attended to so carefully. We think really selectively about orphanhood. We think really selectively about widowhood, but we haven't really attended to kind of the cumulative exposure of mortality in a lot of high mortality populations, despite the fact that it's very consequential to kind of how they view the world and potentially to their behavior. Um, this work also, you know, gives support that perceptions seem to be very, you know, willing to be updated with new information, right? We don't find any evidence of this kind of subtle disposition framework, which in some ways is good news, right? That would suggest that, you know, there's not going to be these long learning lags, right, between mortality change and, and subsequent behaviors, but instead that it's just kind of all the noise that humans are constantly processing that leads to kind of this revision of, of perceptions of aggregate, aggregate conditions. And finally, I think, you know, another really interesting finding is just that, you know, it doesn't seem to be the case that individuals are, you know, neatly organizing in the same kind of schematic framework that we demographers do deaths into these subpopulation bins. Instead, it seems like any death exposure is what um, kind of patterns individual sense of the world. So I have this whole other second part of the talk, which I did not think I would get through, but you can ask me questions about it. I know I'm finishing about five minutes early, but rather than finishing, you know, 10 minutes late, I'll, I'll do that and then happy to answer any questions. But basically the second part of the talk is really just trying to demonstrate that you should care that perceptions are elevated, that they're consequential for how individuals are thinking about other dimensions of their environment. So I'll leave it at that. And I am very much looking forward to your comments and questions.